And Cara, if you hear feedback or anything, just let me know and I can run up and just mute us or something. Oh. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, and you have the links to the first two videos? I do, yes. Okay. Let me know when you want me to jump in. I think you are good to go. You are good to go right now. All right, fantastic. Hello, everybody. I see your your ang your angles. <laughs> We're all looking in different directions <laughs> to a degree. Um, so actually, that's what this is all about. This is all about multiple perspectives and how do we? Oh, there we go. Okay, I see. I see a little bit more facial regions. Um, how do we embody multiple perspectives in our in our daily lives? So I'd like you to begin, if you're comfortable, taking off your shoes and perhaps even your socks and feeling the ground beneath you. I was actually just presenting at Oberlin College in Ohio. And my assumption is in that these institutional environments that the floor is made from a variety of, of toxic petrochemical materials, but actually where I was the environmental studies department in Oberlin College, um, it was made from uh, some kind of cellulose, cellulose um, edible material, not necessarily sponsored by Monsanto um, and corn and soy, but it was pretty impressive, I have to say. <laughs> so I, I don't know if Bishop University has um, hyper-industrial learning environments or actually edible flooring, but if you would take off your shoes. That's not um, All right, I tried it, it's no good. Say again? Oh, you, you did take a bite? All right, Bryn. And thank you, Bryn, so much for inviting me to, to your class. You're such a joy to work with. I'm, I'm so pleased to, to be with you once again. And let me see, in terms of the reverb, you'll just mute it when necessary? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So as we watch two very short videos that I made, um, I'd like you to, along with the awareness of your feet on the ground and bringing in, drawing in a sense of consciousness of the stories of what went into the those objects that you're touching with the with your feet um, in terms of supply chain awareness. We'll start with supply chain awareness. Um, and then I'd also like you to put uh, your hand on an object in front of you. It could be even your eyeglasses or a pen or, or a device or a drinking vessel. Um, and then either on your heart or your stomach um, or perhaps your head where you feel a sense of profound consciousness. So you're making a connection between the object and, and yourself. Um, so we have two, two stories going on. Uh, so we're gonna be playing with infrastructures of storytelling. Um, so one story is moving in through your feet and the other is moving in through your hands. And these are in relation to objects around you that you may, may or may not take for granted, but certainly um, that you have a relationship with. So with that in mind, um, I'll explain a little bit the background of the videos after. Bryn, if you could start, please, with uh, the first short one. Oh, cool. OK, so in, in the first video, I'm dancing on a, a balance beam uh, in front, projected in front of, or dancing in front of projections of the um, human body exposition. Did anyone see that? Um, that particular one was in Seoul of the dissected bodies. Are people familiar with that story? Um, the Bryn, Bryn, are you? Yes, totally. Yes, okay. Um, so these were these were bodies um, mostly of of Asians, um, and the artist, the person was considered an artist, a, a German artist, um, put them in a variety of chemicals to um, present them in museums throughout the world, and they ended up disintegrating publicly. Um, but I'm playing with the idea there as I'm dancing on the balance beam of um, the extraordinarily precarious idea, where are you from? That question that um, I experienced as a child as um, a bridge between my understanding of cultural difference and ethnic difference in relation to the natural, the vulnerability of the natural world and the racist implications of the question, where are you from? 
So, um, and I'm also, so you know that I'm wearing a dress made of VCR, uh, VHS tapes, the ribbon in VHS tapes. And so I'm playing with that kind of storytelling um, in relation to what does it mean to look at the textile tyrannies, the fast fashion industry, and those stories, the stories of the um, child laborers, of the sweatshops, the people who made the, the, the clothes that probably most of us are wearing um, at this moment, and playing with those stories in relation to the stories on the VHS tapes. And that dress that I'm wearing is, is uh, a compilation of of, of the stories. And then in this next video, um, I'm going to be wearing that dress and then along with a fiber shed dress, and I'll explain that afterwards. So in the context of human rights and climate justice, I'd like you to just wrap up about 30 seconds, write down uh, a few of your responses in relation to what you just saw in connect in the connection connecting nodes of both your hands and your feet and the objects, subjects in between uh, that you were touching, are touching. Okay. And so yeah, finish up. And as you're finishing, actually, I'll just tell you a, a little bit about that phrase, where are you from, in relation to my own background as a Sephardic Jew, as an Arab Jew, um, growing up in small towns in Texas and Colorado, I had the frequent experience of children around, especially around the age of nine, 10, coming up to me and putting their hands in my hair, looking for horns, um, assuming, I'm, I'm assuming because um, I'm Jewish and a Jesus killer um, and therefore related to Satan. Um, and they would ask, where are you from? And I would tell them where I was from. Um, Boulder, Colorado, and they would insist, no, are, where are you really from? And it became clear to me over the years that that kind of disassociation with um, difference, with what people uh, perceived as difference, was very much connected to the, um, I didn't necessarily understand them as horrors at the time as, as a child, but as the, the horrors that were going on, um, the infractions, against the natural world around me. And the imperative of addressing these issues simultaneously, human rights, climate justice, um, rather than categorizing, just as we categorize art um, as separate from politics, as separate from our daily lives. So a lot of what I wanna explore, explore with you today is what it means in our daily life to really inhabit, to practice both individually and collectively these these commitments these um, in French there's a world there's a word called um, pulsion I don't know if there's a English translation or if people know know the word pulsion but a, 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 an unbelievably um, uh, integrated compulsion to act um, there's a an eco action model that I've been playing with called soul shared opportunity used local as an as a a, um, a practice of a bioregional learning center and it's that kind of soul based commitment in our daily lives that i'd like to explore with you and ask if you have ideas on languaging since we're we are we live in such a, a language based culture a noun based culture I, in your your reading of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer her chapter on the grammar of um, 
animacy. Have you read that yet? We didn't read Thumbs that. Thumbs up if you have, because I can't hear you. So maybe. Oh, sorry. We didn't read that one in this class. Did anyone else? Not, not in this class. Okay. But the idea that when we noun things, we actually, we strip them of their relationality um, compared to languages that um, are verb based, that are based in a, in a sense of intimacy, what I explore as interspecies intimacies. So for example, when I, um, I think I may have shared this with you before, Bryn, when I was um, an undergrad, there were a series of psychological testings going on in, in, in my university, the Minnesota personality inventory, um, multi-phasic inventory test. And I was given, for example, um, an image of a pineapple, an orange, and a banana, and asked what they have in common. My response was, you peel them. Um, there was a stool, a bench, and a chair. I was asked, what do they have in common? And my response was, you sit on them. So my personality came up as invalid because the correct answers, and they supposedly were correct answers, the correct answers are those three objects, the uh, banana, pineapple, and orange. They're fruit. They're, and they're a noun. There's this, this abstract uh, concept that we agree on in m modernity um, called fruit. And in the case of the chair, the bench, and the stool, the correct answer was not relational. It was furniture. It's this abstract idea. So what, what I am curious about is how can we begin to live a language of verbs? And I'd like to play with, with you and get your ideas about verbs specifically around infrastructures of storytelling. Infrastructure is not a very appealing word. And at the same time, I think so much of what could change in our lives in a pervasive intersectional way um, could actually take place if we had a different, a, a, a more intimate understanding of infrastructure, um, of infrastructural ways of being, of asking questions, of demanding um, that none of this is normal. These are all um, uh, forms of habituated obedience. Um, as I'm sure many of you have read Noam Chomsky's Manufactured Consent, these constructions of desire that we live in a home that is supposed to have certain kinds of electricity, certain kinds of ways of um, maintaining our sense of comfort. And of course, comfort itself is a, a phenomenally um, opaque cultural concept, right? It's not, um, it's not, it's not a given. So are there, first of all, are there any, well, actually, before I ask if there are any questions, let me just explain the vest I was wearing um, in the second piece of the second video um, and the second half of the second video is a fiber shed vest. So it has rather than, again, anonymous people who made the fabrics and the fabrics, the um, materials came from anonymous sources, um, probably laden with all kinds of petrochemical fertilizers. Um, farmers stripped of their autonomy. Um, the fiber shed based, is, are people familiar with the term fiber shed? No, I don't think so. No. Oh, okay. yeah. So fiber shed, like a watershed, fiber shed has to do with local materials, local dyes, local labors. So again, referring to bioregional learning centers. So in that vest, um, there, I, I'm wearing tags made on hemp paper, locally made hemp paper with the uh, kind of animal, the breed of sheep or yak or llama, um, the name of the farmer, the name of the um, spinner, the name of the knitter. So there's, this, again, a sense of intimacy rather than just reinforcing our economies of alienation, but actually, again, inhabiting these intimacies, these interrelationalities. So with that, as a as a 20 minute beginning, uh, where are people? I'd love to hear some some reflections, some questions. Uh, 
Oh, Francois up at the front. I don't know if you can uh, see him, but uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't see Francois. Yeah. All right. Um, my apologies. You cannot uh, really see me, but um, like uh, you from the first uh, video, the, the dress that you were making your performance. Why especially the VCR uh, tapes uh, as an element compared to uh, any other that could have been chosen? Well, yeah, thank you for asking. So the VCR, the VHS tapes, because they're number one, they're they're made from mylar, which is uh, it's not going anywhere, right? That is an a, extremely toxic material. Um, it is um, the, the 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 ribbons are made in a Mobius kind of loop shape, so the idea that time is not linear, that we're constantly feeding into pa multiple pasts and presents, again playing with multiple perspectives, and that these storytellings are not contained, right? Just like microplastics, um, when you wash something. Um, that was made from microplastics. That is not a contained story. That story will live on for how many thousands of years in many, many, many bodies, ocean bodies, animal bodies, marine life bodies, our own bodies. Um, so the the VHS, uh, the VCR tapes are playing with that kind of both in the construction that Mobius strip loop in the construction. Um, of of those stories that we take for granted, you stick in, you stick your, or we did once upon a time in the 80s and the 90s, put our our tape cassettes and our our um, movies in in the machine and watch other people's stories. So playing with the idea of object as storyteller. And um, for example, I was dancing, I was wearing that, and I was dancing in a field of of yaks. Of uh, one of my friends who has a a yak farm and her father who's also a yak farmer um really thought i was a hypocrite um because there i am dancing in these incredibly uh divorced materials the v the vhs tape the synthetic materials with these animals and he thought in a way i was mocking the animals but i'm playing with these layers of contradiction and that we straddle these multiple worlds all the time especially those of us who are really struggling to not participate, not be as compliant as so many of us are in terms of um, maintaining the status quo. So it's a we're constantly, as I was doing, dancing on a balance beam. We're walking these very precarious zones, these in between spaces. So yeah, thank you for for asking. I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you. I really like just uh, when you got them to, uh, yeah, like touch an object and then something on their bodies. Um, yeah. Did anyone like have a, did that, I find it reminds me of like when I, when I meditate and if you do it long enough, you no longer see a, like a division between yourself and the universe. Like you're just like, oh, I, I am this. And then I feel like that's what happens with like the object. If you do it long enough, you're suddenly like, oh, we're just, or atoms. And like, I don't know, that's kind of what I experienced. What did other people experience? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Any thoughts? Does that feel moving to you or any questions based on what you've seen so far? It's dark outside. I think <laughs> you feel like tired. <laughs> uh, tell me some of the objects people put their hands on and then I'd like to know why you put yeah. your hands on that object and did it, did the sense of the, when I say, for example, when I say supply chain, um, are people familiar with supply chain? So supply chain consciousness, okay. Um, so the embodied energy, right? The embodied energy of an object similar to a supply chain was that story becoming more apparent in the context of what, looking at the videos, shifting our frame of reference from wondering what where a person comes from actually to wondering where an object comes from. What were some of the objects people had their hands on? Just call out. An eraser. Coffee mug. Great. And um, for example, with um, the eraser, since that's more of a singular, a coffee mug may have multiple 
um, components, a cell phone, clearly many, many components. Um, with the eraser, was there a sense of the rubber plantation, for example? Uh, for me, it was mostly like the, um, the, the paper cover on it that's like slowly oh. deteriorating. And that's what I was thinking about because as I was holding it in different ways, I would, like I was feeling it going and going and going. And it's like, it's yes. kind of ironic that the cover of the eraser is being erased. It's being erased. Yes, yes, yes. And that playfulness, I like, I like that sense of playfulness. If, if, so one of my main questions for you during this, this time is how can we, oh, maybe turn off the reverb or the, thank you. Thank you. Joy. You're, you're going to be running back and forth, Bryn. No um, One of my questions is, Without being overwhelmed, right? We're already dealing with climate grief, climate anxiety, what is now being um, called in 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 mass uh, ecological distress. How can we ask ourselves those stories? How can we be playful with those stories um, without being overwhelmed? For example, the idea of the cybopath. If if you've heard of that, put your thumb up. Okay, so cybopath referring to, oh, did someone? No, okay. Um, referring to some to somebody who, uh, when they bite into something, so cybo meaning food, they taste the history of the food. So that story is apparent to them in their cellular consciousness. So for example, if they bite into a banana, they taste the history of the banana the supply chain, the embodied energy of the banana. They taste whether or not it was grown with DDT that's been exported from the US, that's been banned in the US and exported to the global south. And they taste the um, stories of the people in the banana plantations. They taste the stories of the cargo ship that was, that where it was transported with the oil and gas industries. Um, or if a person takes a bite out of a hamburger, uh, they taste whether or not it came from a CAFO, uh, um, a concentrated animal feeding operation, or whether or not it came from a local small farm, grass-fed animal. Um, so those stories are embedded in the, again, the intimacy of biting into something. So when you're holding on to an object, what if, and this is what I'd like to play with as, as the underlying um, exploration with you, what if our epigenetic potential, so our potential to move beyond what is already in our genes, but beyond our genetic makeup, what if that story or those stories could inform how we are consumers, could inform how we relate to one another, could inform how we parent, could inform how we educate ourselves. And this, to me, it's not esoteric. It's very much rooted in um, our the potential of our cellular makeup and something fundamental that isn't just a Band-Aid. Um, some of you, I think, saw some of my other work, my my uh, video lectures on YouTube, where I'm exploring the falsehoods of renewable energies that, uh, quote unquote, renewables are actually rooted in fossil fuel economies. And for us to maintain our standard of living and maintain uh, our status quo ideas of what is comfort, what is necessary, how do we achieve those comforts and those necessities um, at the expense of sacrifice zones, right? Animals, people, uh, ecosystems, more than human ecosystems um, that are being destroyed by our, by what we think is necessary in our lives. And what if we were to go beyond that? So my suggestion is that that possibility is already within us. Uh, Stephen Hawking has a, a beautiful phrase, everything we need to know is already within us just waiting to be realized. 
And that's this epigenetic potential that I, I'd like to play with you in relation to the cybopath, for example, in relation to the person holding their cell phone. Are you conscious of where some of the components came from? The cobalt, for example, um, the, or excuse me, the tungsten, for example, tungsten makes cell phones vibrate that um, the majority of tungsten comes from mines in the Congo in Central Africa, as an example. And those people's lives are embedded in our cell phones. And how do we make different decisions? And that doesn't mean, as I mentioned in the video on my home, it's not operating out of guilt. That's not operating out of fear, but it's operating out of a sense of, again, intimacy, a sense of relationality with others around us. So I'd love to hear some some reflections, what this means in terms of what you've been learning with Bryn. So I guess uh, um, the, the mute off. That's useful. Yeah, I guess even is that something you think about? I just try to think of something relatable with like the meat industry and how, you know, if it's packaged, you don't really think about it as being an adorable little cow, right? It's like, you don't have to see the story behind it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like, we were talking about like Thoreau and like awareness and awakening and like noticing and paying attention. I think what you were doing too is just making us, yeah, be aware of the story of the object and how it's not disconnected from us, right? So I don't know, yeah, Leah is, uh, Leah's brilliant. Oh, they're all brilliant. Uh, see if there she is, turquoise. <laughs> okay chicken here but if we're talking about epigenetics and we're thinking about cows and cafos for example like wouldn't that generation after generation of cow under stress technically affect us because that's being passed down so we are carrying all of that with us does that make sense absolutely absolutely so it's that kind of understanding that those those lives that were so horribly brutalized that are now part of our cells. And if we begin to play with that kind of awareness, so it's a combination of somatic awareness, so in, in our body and, and a cerebral awareness. And then how do we create infrastructures based on these layers of consciousness? Yeah, thank you for, for, for bringing that up. Anyone else? Is there like an object that you touched that you didn't really like think, for example, so say someone touched their like laptop or something. Um, so then thinking about like the history of that too. And what else did people, oh, I see Aurora. I don't feel, you might have to come up. You could try yelling Aurora. <laughs> um, not so much an object, but it reminded me of what reading the na uh, Nature by Emerson about how his like holistic view of nature. Yeah. Uh, like seeing like everyone's kind of connected and appreciating nature for more than just beauty. Yeah, that's so nice. Were you able to hear that, Clara? Yes, yeah. So, right. So, beauty, but also a, a non-utilitarian. Right, so a tree isn't just shade. It's not just sequestering carbon, but it has its own story. It has its own life force, regardless of our observing, regardless of our uh, attention to it and how do we coexist in a way that isn't just about usurping, uh, isn't about commodifying the shade or commodifying the beauty, right? Like with, with Emerson. Um, one challenge I've been dealing with recently, we had a, a book reading um, and maybe turn off the reverb if, if you're able to. Thank you. Um, we had a book reading in my small community recently by uh, Ben Goldfarb on his new book on road ecologies uh, called Crossings um, something, how roads shape, I don't remember the, the whole title, but it has to do, oh, how well, how roads shape road ecology. So road ecology being the, the stories around car culture with highways that blanket the, the world. Um, and the people's lives and animals' lives who are affected, and one of the, or, or um, not affected, but uh, eviscerated, I'll say, um, and one of the 
responses to, to this globally has been to make crossings right, migratory crossings for animals, for example, um, so that we can maintain our, our, again, our status quo, our standard of living with our car culture addictions and, and those infrastructures, and then add on top of that crossings. So again, how do we not just adapt and assimilate to our own hubris, you know, to our own relentless arrogance of just, oh, well, we can just keep on going at the same speed in the name of progress, in the name of development, um, and spend billions and billions of dollars on uh, research and development and infrastructure to justify, oh, well, we're helping this elk migratory pattern, for example because we're building a, a a very complex crossing that not only allows for the elk, but it also allows <clears throat> for the toads. I mean, it's there, there, it, there's some, I, I don't know if people have, have heard about these international crossings, but it's um, it blows my mind that we are so willing to spend so much money and time and creativity to create infrastructural band-aids. And again, what if we were to go back to our bodies and our body's relationality, our body's relationship, you know, that, that again, sitting on the stool, the bench and the chair, peeling the banana, the pineapple and the orange. What if our world rotated around that kind of dynamic and not, how can we maintain our sense of efficiency? People are familiar with Jevons' paradox, Jevons' paradox of efficiency. Um, in the late 1800s, Jevons wrote about the the idea of efficiency itself is rooted in um, a self-destructive mentality. And so, and here we are in 2023, when so much of how we justify our lives is based on efficiency, and that's rooted in self-destruction. So how can we come together, for example, like with soul, shared opportunity used local, how can we come together in our individual lives, our community, our sense of community relationships, community action, and at the same time, instilling a sense of corporate accountability, taking sometimes extreme actions for corporate accountability, and then having that roll over into infrastructural design, redesigns, policy reform. So those simultaneous worlds, this is not about shaming the individual, this is not about taking shorter showers, it's about relationship. And how do we begin to, in ourselves, embed that possibility that these changes, and not just, I won't say changes, that these expansions can take place with a commitment to profound, profound awareness. So again, I'd love, I'd love people's feedbacks. Does this sound um, impossible? Does it sound ridiculous <laughs> does it sound privileged you know the whole the whole idea of privilege i get that a lot that um i have the privilege to be able to play with these ideas even though i've i have always lived far below the poverty line um not by choice necessarily but and obviously i do have education i, I got my doctoral uh, degree in in critical philosophy years ago but what if we were able to work together across these differences and to question the idea of privilege and entitlement in and of itself as we're exploring these relationships? Love it. I think Elsie, El did you have your hand up? Yeah, right over here in the cool sun. I was just curious what you would do instead of building bridges, given the fact that 
to reconstruct the entire infrastructure of our vehicle system would mean that we would have to reconstruct the way that our government and society works. So is it more beneficial to construct these bridges and potentially save animals, given that, that we are unlikely to change in the near future to a system such as trains that might be more <laughs> like might right, be conducive. Better, yeah, conducive with an environment. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, this, the same question is asked around renewables, for example, with solar panels. And again and again, I go back to the imperative of doing things differently um, with those simultaneous commitments, the individual, the community. Could, could you could you mute the? Yeah, thank you. The individual, the community, the corporate accountability, the infrastructural redesign and, and with policy. Because the amount of energy, psychological and and physical energy that is going into, for example, solar panel research, these bridges, these crossings, that needs to be redirected as we are learning to live differently in our daily lives. So I think what's happening with things like solar panels, when buy, when people want to buy, I mean, for example, we have solar panels on our roof. They're used solar panels. The batteries are used. The control system is used. There is so much out there already. That's why with Seoul, shared opportunity used local, if we build infrastructures of reuse, for example, and repurposing and putting our creativity and innovation, right? Corporations love the term innovation. If we redirect our innovation into an economy of intimacy, an economy of solidarity, rather than the stopgap measures, because I think what's happening again and again with these stopgaps is that we're then creating entire worlds around renewables, quote unquote, I don't even want to say the word renewables, around this illusory green economy and losing our potential to actually make fundamental root changes. So examining the roots as we're making those changes rather than these kind of imbricated band-aids, which is one reason why greenwashing is so is so destructive because if people say we have to do incremental changes and, and we can't make that change until 2030 and then we can't make that change until 2050 we have to do this now but if we did what so many of us are suggesting for example in deep deep green resistance like for example derek jensen's work it in the now that money that creativity that commitment could be directed in very, very different ways in terms of reconstructing our idea of what is a healthy standard of living. What is hygiene? For example, water use. I live in a, uh, in a small Colorado town. Water is one of the biggest issues. We're constant, it's the high desert essentially, and we're constantly dealing with issues of drought. We live here, and this is, and it's about scale. So we live, where we're able to get enough water from rainwater. We've built a, a rain catchment system, which is actually illegal in Colorado if it exceeds a certain amount, which we're not exceeding. Um, but just the fact that even raindrop, raindrop um, is a commodity. So it's that kind of awareness that in the quest for water in our small town, rather than building more homes with flush toilets, we commit to understanding that there are other ways of being. There are other ways of using, for example, humanure, that we have had centuries of misinformation around waste, around human waste. And if we were to learn, for example, what is already within us, like our poop, just waiting to be realized in a different way, in a different capacity. We could build infrastructures that use a tremendous uh, uh, decrease in water. 
using humanure as an example in our small town. You know, we're not in Denver, which is a big city. We're in a small community. And even in our small community, there's such resistance because there's such misinformation around our bodies, around bacteria, as an example. So it's that kind of shift where we say, oh, we can't do this now. We have to relinquish our power. We have to relinquish our energy. We have to relinquish our agency to the expert, to the corporation who knows better than we do. And they will build this stopgap measure. <laughs> and then again, all of these worlds of infrastructures, all of these uh, stories that go into that way of maintaining, again, another normalcy. And then we have to fight that. Or let's say we have to deconstruct that normalcy, where now renewables, it, it, it's, um, it's very difficult to even critique renewables because people now feel so attached that this is our, this is our only alternative. When in fact, it's not an alternative at all. It's just replacing one hegemony with another. It's just reinforcing the very challenge that we're trying to disrupt. <laughs> the very set, the very set of systemic oppressions that we're trying to disrupt. And we know that when we look at how solar panels are mined, the, the minerals for the photovoltaics are mined. When we look at how they're disposed of, we see the environmental racism. We see the people's lives who are involved and the wildlife, the ecosystems. So we have to be so careful when we talk about, well, this needs to happen now because we're just reinforcing the crisis in that process, and we're missing a lot of opportunities. Thank you for asking that question. I I can't see your face, so I, I don't know how you're responding facially, but. Um. Thanks, Cara. That was such a good uh, response. It's just what you've been saying made me think of uh, Daniel Pitchbeck has this book, How Soon Is Now? A Handbook for mm. Global Change. Um, and yeah, he says, I love this, as we realize we are the agents who create meaning for ourselves and each other, we discover we have the sacred, joyful task of defining a new mythology for our future unfolding together. Um, so yeah, just showing that we are capable. And then he brings in uh, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, and he developed the idea of morphic resonance, re sorry, resonance, uh, which yes. theorizes that the laws of nature are not fixed, but immutable, and that their habits or patterns that become more coherent over time until they seem permanent. Um, and then what he says is he gives the example of like crystals forming and says when like a certain group of crystal molecules come together, it makes it more likely another crystal will appear given the same conditions. Uh, so as this happens a few times, the morphogenetic field strengthens, stabilizes, and crystals form reliably, but the pattern could change given new information. So then he compares that to like shifting our focus right now and how we feel like the way things are really permanent. But in fact, they're not. We just need to to shift shift our focus and not be scared of change. So anyway, that came to mind when you were talking. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You reminded me of two critical points, um, and the the um, morphog morphogenetic field is or, or genetic field is um, another way of speaking about biomimicry, and so two realms when we're talking about what is already within us just waiting to be realized. Number one is is that field, is biomimicry, learning potential ways of being from our natural world. And there is so much both beauty and curiosity in, in that realm of learning, of paying attention to the natural world around us as giving us models as guiding us through these kinds of um, inhabitations, these, these kinds of embodiments. And the other is our ancestral wisdoms, those ancient technologies that can guide us. Um, and not just ancient, but 
how that those ancient worlds are often still vital with us now in terms of cross-cultural examples, cross-cultural models of how can we live right now, 2023, differently than what we're doing in our Western industrial, cyber, petrochemical addicted, pharmaceutical addicted contexts. And um, I saw Zazu Dreams going around. Um, this is the the new version, if you can see that. The updated edition will be out next year with a forward by Vandana Shiva. And that goes through these kinds of relationships, <laughs> these kinds of relationships of ancestral technologies. So technology, techne. Techne, I think at this point, we come to think of technology as digital technology rather than the root of the word technology is tech is um, to weave or to fabricate. Um, and that's another, let me just extend uh, into another uh, tendril, which is our language. If we would go back to even the English language, which is, is has so many uh, deficits, there is so much there at the same time. Looking at the root of techne, of technology, techne, looking at the root of the word radical. Radical means root, right? Looking at the root of something is considered radical. Looking at the root of the word, the origin of the word education, to educate. Educate doesn't mean pour in pre-digested information and you're gonna excrete you know, the same, essentially. Education, ed, to educate means to draw out. So again, remembering what is already within us, just waiting to re be realized. Our own ancestral memories, going back to, and again, not back as in a linear back, but this Mobius strip kind of imagery of time, back to the, the VHS loop on the, on the dress that I was wearing, so that we, ha we remember that we have these resources. We don't need to spend millions and trillions of dollars on new technologies. So this is the image of the timeline in Zazu Dreams, our petrochemical era and, and pre-petrochemical era. Any comments on that in relation to what Bryn shared? Yes, we have a question from Sabine. Which way do I go? There she is in the fuchsia. <laughs> well, it's not really about like um, the illustrations. I do love the illustrations, but I was wondering how you were able um, to like build uh, your house the way it is. And are you like happy with it or do you have like any regrets? And how has it been like living in your house? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking about the house. Yeah, and there, there. I, I know that there were other questions, so yeah, I'm happy to to jump into to that. Um, we are delighted. I have to say, I I never would have thought that this would have felt like the space would have felt um, accommodating to myself, <laughs> my partner. We have a 12 year old son and a very big dog, um, and. Of course, things are getting much more complicated as my son becomes a teenager. And that that being in relation to him having to straddle these worlds, like what we were talking about before, being in, in many places at once, where he's straddling these layers of normalcy. Um, and then he comes home, you know, he's got one foot in in let's say the real world <laughs> and then coming home to our world. And that's a huge challenge. And it's also an extraordinary opportunity, not to be cliche, but an opportunity for us to talk about what is taken for granted. So the process of the house, I feel that the, what we did was, it wasn't even necessarily uh, that we went out, that that our goal was to only use repurposed goods. But as we were doing it, as we were building the home, um, which we 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 got the bus. All of this was in um, the suburbs of Detroit. Um, 
it was just so clear that that's what needed to be happen that that, that needed to be happening it was um it was just one of course after and of course and oh and then this is this is uh, this is an option um these like the 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 shelves the the um subflooring um that holds the used insulation the walls all of th that was 15 or uh, 14 foot pine boxes that we found in an alley um a uh, distributes a company that distributes uh, pipes, metal pipes, transports these pipes in pine boxes, 14 foot pine boxes that are just thrown away afterwards. So we happen to find this. So a lot of what I'm suggesting is being open to the unknown to accident. Um, I just wrote a piece on surrealism and the sacred. And what does it mean to live in a space of sacred consciousness, sacred activism, where you are open to all of these unexpected possibilities, unexpected relationships. So it was that kind of, at every turn, it, it, there was no need to buy anything new. Because we, we were, we had set ourselves up to find things, to be in discussion with others in very unlikely situations. And a lot of this has to do with unexpected alliances, unpredictable affinities, where you're open to situations where you thought, oh, that person, no, I don't, I'm not, I have nothing to do with that person politically, ethically, you know, they're, they're where you assume that there's a wall, but actually, there can be the most joyous connection if we're not just building walls, you know, but if we're really looking for those places of connective tissue. And that's so much of how the the our our love bus just unfolded. And then we made it, again, this wasn't our intention necessarily, but we made it a homeschool opportunity for my son at the time he was um six when we started, six years old. And so we made it. An, a, an educational opportunity, not just for him, but then for the eco village where we lived when we moved after it was primarily built. And then that expanded out. So it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm offering to all of you the possibility of what it means to jump into the unknown. And we're doing it together. And we're doing it without having any idea, right, where we're going to land but with some sense of how can we live with integrity as as we're entering you know the the unknown and how can we be open to these accidents and for me that's part of the joy I love that, Cara. I've said this before and they've heard this, but yeah, there's also the actual neuroscience that says that um, like uncertainty is, is what forces us to change and challenges us. So yeah, like um, I'm not creating his name right now, but yeah, it's actually Bo Lotto. Yeah, it's always saying like step into uncertainty because uh, that, yeah, so that's, that speaks to me so much. I was also wondering, what would you like, can you examples of like extreme actions for corporate accountability? Um, if, uh, yeah, or if that and also, I think a lot of students were wondering if, like, you think it's feasible for for lots of people to start uh, living and, and living like you are, because I know there's like a desire. Um, uh, so many parts. So, a sort of options for extreme actions for corporate accountability, and then be like whether you think it's, you know, if the students wanted to try this out or something. Well, I would say, you know, I'm 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 told all the time that in, even at the eco villages, which is one reason why we've moved from various eco villages, <laughs> that we were too radical. Or that I was too radical, um, definitely too outspoken, um, especially as a parent. Um, so, two examples would be, um, and this isn't just about individuals, but but working with others, to not own a smartphone, for example. Um, I've never owned a smartphone. I, I do use a flip phone. Um, I'm obviously using a computer right now, but. Even just the normalization of app culture 
and not playing into that by not owning one and not just not yourself, but working with other people. And this again, again goes into re-infrastructuring. How do we create infrastructures so that we don't have to own smartphones or I've never owned a car. I don't have to own a car in order to function as an active person in the world, as a parent. I mean, again, back to the challenges with the, the, um, Sabine, uh, is, is that your name? Yes. Yeah, um, your, your question, that, that's a massive, massive challenge with my son, right? He wants, he wants, he doesn't want to be different. He's half black, he's half Sephardic, he lives in a school bus, he grew up in eco villages, you know, he's got, he's got a lot of um, non normalcies that he has to contend with. And how can we create infrastructures so that the norm isn't this white erasure, this greenwashing erasure? Um, so those would be two examples of people working together in their daily lives, refusing to own, refusing to do, but collectively and making it not a refusal as in a negation, but as an opportunity for growth, not in terms of U.S. economies. For example, um, we just uh, set up something called Soul Space, Shared Opportunity Use Local. So a community space, it's a, fr a free store, essentially, an exchange space, a gift economy structure in our community where people come and go and you take whatever you need, you give um, you give your your excess, the, the idea of excess, of waste, of disposability, transforming the idea of waste and trans and and disposability so that there is no waste. Like in nature, there is no waste. Right? Everything there's there are continual relationships through the mycelium. You know, how can we myceliate our lives. Um, and then your second question, Bryn. What was my second question? Oh yeah, just uh, whether you think like, um, there was a quotation on your oh, study. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, um, so again, this this isn't, I'm not suggesting people go back, you know, it's not a return to the land, it's not, um, Certainly, very few people are going to actually go convert a, a school bus and live in it or, or, or a shipping container and live in that. Um, but the idea of how can I, in the structures that I'm currently in, in an apartment building in the middle of Montreal, um, for example, how can I bring in a sense of curi curiosity, bring in a sense of amazement? Rabbi Heschel. Uh, he speaks about radical am amazement. How can we wake up in the morning with a sense of radical amazement? So we're not just in an automatic mode where our smartphone rings, we wake up, we're just participating in this world of what is the next thing, but we're, where we're actually taking a pause to pay attention to where we are, what objects we're in relation to, can we not buy that additional thing that we think is necessary? Can we be in relation to that person in a different way because we know that we have um, a, a kind of relationship based on, um, you know, if we're if we're both wearing Nike tennis shoes or something like that, can we actually have a conversation? Okay, where do these shoes come from? Whose lives were involved? Maybe we don't need to buy another pair. You know, maybe we can build infrastructures in our community. Um, there are uh, even in the middle of when when I was living in Manhattan and in the Bronx, um, we had free stores set up and the, the freegan communities for example, where we have a different relationship to waste that isn't based in um, a, a class economy that is about degradation. You know, so often we think of dumpster diving, for example, and you think of dirt, you know, you think of something less than, less, the quality is less than, there's, there's, um, there's uh, ideas around hygiene. What if gleaning, are people familiar with the idea of gleaning? 
Gleaning. So gleaning historically is when you um, go to fields, agricultural fields, and pick up the food that wasn't harvested. And there's so much food that's there. I mean, as those of you who are involved with food justice know, we have a massive amount, a massive abundance of food in, in the world. The question is not quantity. The question is distribution and quality. So how can we in our urban environments or our rural environments, but in our spaces where we don't have the possibility of, of or we don't have the desire to, to live in an alternative structure, in an adobe structure or a cob structure or, um, you know, a, a, a something that is considered inherently ecologically friendly, but how can we in our lives create systems of, of relationality based on gleaning, gleaning in our communities where we we have clothing swaps, for example. I mean, that, that was one of the, the best things about living in New York, you know, or San Francisco all those years, because we built relationships. Objects weren't just about anonymous acquisitions, but objects were bridges for people to connect with one another. I love that. Thank you so much, Cara. Um, and yeah, so many good points too. Yeah, it's interesting too with like cell phones. I was like you, I had a flip phone till about three years ago or something and same with my mom. But yeah, the efficient efficiency thing too. I was like, oh, well now I need one because it's, you know, I, everyone else has them and blah, blah, blah. But if you like find some friends or something that are willing to opt out with you and then you have that circle of people, then yeah, it makes it easier. So I really like that idea of community because you feel so isolated. Like, oh, what's going to, what's going to happen? If I don't own a cell phone, what's that going to do? But if you do that and then you have a friend who opts in, that is very hopeful. I love that. And and going back to scale, right? I mean, a lot of this, so much of this has to do with scale. Again, bioregions. How can we have multiple, multiple bioregions rather than thinking that this, we have to have universal norms that cover all our differences. But instead we have multiple centers. It's a multiverse that we're operating in. So cool. I see a question, I get Aurora. I just because talking about bioregions and a lot of the infrastructures that you kind of challenge have a lot to do with like globalization. So I kind of just want to hear your opinion about that and like, can you get benefits from it that migrate the negative consequences from them? Okay, the last part of your can you get benefits? How do you get the benefits from them, but also kind of like mitigating the negative consequences of globalization? Well, I mean, part of that is the idea of used, right, in, in shared opportunity use local. Um, these, the product, the items that we're using were part of globalization. So, so I mean, the, um, the metals were mined, you know, maybe, maybe in a Bolivian tin mine, for example, the metals on the, on the, um, windowsills of the bus, for example. So I am I am benefiting and I'm trying to mitigate by only looking for products that are already manufactured. And if someone would say to me, well, what if we all did that, then there wouldn't be any used objects. I really doubt that that would be the case. <laughs> you know, I think that there, if we look at, for example, um, one of my dance pieces I'm, where I'm wearing the VHS, um, dress. I'm dancing in front of projections of in the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, 39,000 tons of unworn textiles. So it's a garbage heap. So used, not just committing from <laughs> here on out, not to buy a single you uh, new anything. And from for me, it's been about 35 years. Um, no, not a single anything, um, even toothpaste tubes. I work in community. Um, you can make your own toothpaste. Um, but also what I do at the clothing swaps, 
and this may seem extreme to some people, but what I do is uh, people who, you know, empty out their toothpaste tubes, there's still a lot of toothpaste in there. Um, and this may seem so ridiculously, so ridiculously minute, the minutia, but if we had economies, again, these, these micro economies based in an awareness that the toothpaste tube is not apolitical, that's an intensely political item, product, not just the tube, but of course the fluoride, the politics around fluoride, the misinformation around that hygiene, you know, how um, um, in, in, in medical contexts and dental contexts, how that's a given, I mean, and the, and the damages to our body. I mean, so there's so many layers. So, and that to me is exciting. That's maybe I can even just leave you with that. Um, let's see if I can find this image in the back of Zazu Dreams. Um, if we think, if we remember that all uh, oppressions, all, all our systematic oppressions are interconnected. So here's an image, I don't know if you can see. Um, it's a tree with roots, tree branches. <laughs> Things like uh, corporate water tyranny, unnatural disasters, floods, fires, uh, methane overload, industrial economy, uh, consumerism, ethnocentrism, crop failure, renewables revolution, agribusiness, habitat loss, things like that. Sustainability is in there also. Um, if we remember that these oppressions are interconnected, we can also remember that they, that the emancipation, that the radical uprooting of these interconnected oppressions are also, our emancipation is also interconnected. And to me, that's exhilarating. That, that gives me a sense of possibility as a parent of a 12 year old who wants to play video games, um, you know, that, that, and wants a cell phone because, I'll, because he's the only one who doesn't have one, for example, that gives me a sense of, okay, I'm in this incredibly challenging position and I have to remember that the, that the relationships are, are bound together, that these hegemonies are bound together and so is my agency, so is my sense of empowerment if I am working in community.